Hello, wonderful. This is Sarah. And I want you to imagine you've been in a toxic relationship, which is pretty typical if you're listening to this podcast. And then you have all these symptoms and signs and trauma and what, what's happened and is it normal? Is it not normal? And that can be really scary to navigate. So we have Shelly Pumphrey and she's going to talk to us about what happens after a toxic relationship. Hello, Shelly. How are you? Hi, Sarah. I am good. I'm happy to be here today. Well, as we were talking about this subject, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't think I've ever had a podcast on this, which is kind of a shame on me, but it's it, I, I did write by bringing you in <laughs> to lead us through this. Awesome. Well, I love to talk about it and, you know, toxic relationships are, are part of being toxic person proof. So this is a great Absolutely. conversation to have. Absolutely. So, you know, um, tell people a tiny bit about your background and I know you have a book and therapist. Yeah. 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 So I am a mental health therapist in Colorado and a licensed professional counselor. I have, um, I founded a therapy practice called Trilogy Holistic Mental Health. And I also have a separate private practice where I specialize in helping people recover from toxic relationships and narcissistic abuse. Um, I've been a therapist for about 30 years and my specialty really is in trauma and holistic mental health, as well as these toxic relationships. And recently, just this uh, early spring. Yeah. Quick, quick, just about your book. Okay. Because you talked about specializing in something, right? And I, I really want to emphasize that to people who are looking to get help. Because I think there's this, you've been through something, it's just terrible. And then you just think, okay, I just need to find a therapist. Right. Right. And it's really important to find the right type of help for this situation that you're in, because some people, you know, I've talked to so many therapists and trained so many therapists. I think there's this assumption that every therapist, especially 30 years ago, basically got their master's in abusive relationships. Right. Which is not true. (laughs) (laughs) It is an assumption. Totally. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's an assumption. And I, I am quite certain the medical practice with our world's obsession with narcissism Mm -hmm. will lean more into that information um but i really do want people to hear that because and and to not give up if you find a therapist you go to someone and they didn't really understand what you were talking about or something it doesn't mean that you can't find help it just means you haven't found help yet absolutely and i'm really you know really passionate about helping people understand that because you know like like you're kind of mentioning I cannot even tell you how many people have come to me who've actually had, I almost want to call it secondary abuse, not necessarily intentionally, but because they went to either a couples therapist or an individual therapist who did not actually understand narcissistic abuse and made things worse. And it is not something that we, it is a specialty. And it's not something that just your run-of-the-mill counseling program um, or psychology program trains us in. Well, I I talk about it as um, figuring out the right problem to solve because it's also interesting. I talk to people and I'll say, what are you doing to heal from a toxic relationship? And they'll say, well, I'm I'm joining a gym. And I'm like, awesome. Can you give me some statistics around people who exercise are less likely to end up in toxic relationships? And they laugh and they say, well, no. And I say, exercise is great, but it's not solving the problem right. that you're wanting to solve. Right. And it's not bad. It's not good. It's right. just different problems. Right. And you don't go see an OBGYN for a heart issue. Right. And it doesn't mean it's not a good OBGYN, but um, exactly, you know, so, uh, okay, great. And now you're about, I, I interrupted you in talking about the book. That's okay. <laughs> Yeah, so the book is called Insight is 2020, How to Trust Yourself to Protect Yourself from Narcissistic Abuse and Toxic Relationships. And it really, you know, it's 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 a great book for people who are in romantic relationships with toxic partners, but it's also a lot of general advice for anybody dealing with a toxic person in their life and how to really identify, you know, is this a narcissist or some other kind of personality disorder, which we can talk about here in a bit. Um, and it, it really talks about the trauma and the, 
holistic, like different ways that this kind of abuse affects you. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on even just physically in the body and, um, you know, what actual trauma symptoms look like that a lot of people may not know, you know, is actually a trauma symptom because they're not aware of this very particular form of abuse. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty comprehensive review of, of, you know, how to identify these relationships and what to do to start your healing process. So what are some trauma symptoms that the average person may not understand? Well, one of the, the, the main kind of hallmark symptoms of narcissistic abuse or, well, you know, first of all, let me just back up for a minute and, and give the right terminology for this. So really the correct way to look at these relationships is what's called a pathological love relationship. And this, this term was coined by Sandra Brown. She is a therapist who has really done a lot of groundbreaking research on pathological love relationships. And so a pathological love relationship is when you are in an intimate relationship with a partner who has what we call a cluster B personality disorder or traits of one. And that means they are a narcissist or narcissistic. They could have what, what we call antisocial personality disorder, which is more about not respecting rules, not thinking the rules are for them. They can be you know, involved in criminal behavior. Um, there's also borderline personality, which um, is a lot of dramatic kind of hot, cold, push-pull kind of relationships. Um, and then there could also be a psychopath um, which is somebody who doesn't have a conscience at all. Um, and then narcissism, where a lot of grandiosity, thinking they're better than everybody, not able to really self-reflect or see their behavior affecting others. Um, these are very short snippets of these, but essentially what happens is if you are in a relationship with someone with one or more of these personality disorder traits, you will suffer inevitable harm because of it, because there is a lot of behaviors. There's a lack of empathy. There could be a lack of conscious or conscious consciousness. If um, you know they have, um, like, if they're a psychopath, and you can't be in a relationship like that and not be harmed because of the consequences of you know being with someone. Shelley, like this. what if you just love even more? Can that save it? Absolutely not. What if you just change yourself and make yourself small? Can that save it? Absolutely not. What if you just stop having an opinion? Can that, can that keep you from harm? No. And what these are you... all things that happen. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, we're laughing because it's, when you, when you live and work in this topic, you just gotta, I don't know, you gotta find the sunshine in right. it. We don't think it's funny, but... This is like normal, right? And it's just, and just the, the way these con artists manipulate minds to think, well, you need to work harder. You need to be smarter. You need to, mm -hmm. um, you know, be more sexy, lose weight, give me more money, put out more, whatever it is. Right. right. And, and, and then they tell us, well, we will, ch we will be nice to you when you change your behavior and it creates a cycle of madness. Yes, totally. And those are all, you know, we can talk in a moment here about why we end up doing a lot of those behaviors to maintain the relationship. Um, but I want to kind of go back and answer, like, you know, you asked, what are some of the trauma symptoms? And so the hallmark trauma symptom of somebody in a relationship like this is something called cognitive dissonance. And what that is, is where, you know, essentially cognitive dissonance is where you have two opposing truths in your mind. So a good example is, you know, somebody who smokes and is addicted to nicotine and they will, you know, they may know, you know, I've read all this research. I know, you know, smoking causes cancer, but I continue to smoke. And it's like, you have to choose one or the other. Am I not going to smoke because I know that smoking causes cancer, or am I going to keep smoking and deny that so that I can keep smoking, right? So in a survivor of a relationship like this, what happens is you start to do a lot of comparing and contrasting. 
and you see like one minute you're, I, you know, I love this person. I can't imagine leaving my partner. The next minute you're in total fear. You can't believe the behavior that you're experiencing. You don't understand why they're being so cruel to you. And you may find yourself going through this kind of, I like to call it looped thinking, you know, throughout the day of, I love them. I hate them. I love, she's great. She's my terrorist, you know, and it's this constant confusion about your partner's behaviors and then about the relationship itself. Is this, you know, my soulmate relationship or is this an abusive relationship? And then ultimately, at the end of the day, you start to have cognitive dissonance about yourself, where you might have had these high ideals. Like, I would never let somebody abuse me, yet I put up with this abuse every day. And there starts to develop a lot of shame around, you, you know, you're, you're staying in the relationship with that. Well, and within that cognitive dissonance, you have the Jekyll and Hyde personality of the abusive yes. person, right? So it's like, oh man, um, everyone thinks he's wonderful. He's such a good man. You know, mm -hmm. you're so like that person. And then it's like, well, but he's really angry and mean yes. and like says horrible things about me. Oh, you're just so lucky. He's so good looking. He's so successful. He's so whatever it is. Right. Yeah. And so that cognitive dissonance, um, golly, you know, the, the show about like the Grinch and the Grinch's heart grows like eight sizes uh -huh. too big, whatever it is. Like every time I talk about this subject and the, that cognitive dissonance piece, because society puts, if you have a toxic person at work, who's ugly to you, people say, oh man, that stinks. And if you have a romantic toxic relationship or, or I'm going to say, if you get conned out of money at work or a bad business deal or whatever, a bad real estate thing, people are like, oh, you got conned. And then if you're in a romantic relationship, people are like, oh, you're dumb. Right. Right. And yes. my heart gets so big oh. in this, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's just like, if you had any idea yeah. what that cognitive dissonance, when, when there is a man screaming, cutting you down, telling you that you'll be homeless without him, you can't even survive without him, you're such a C-U-N-T or whatever, and then they walk out the door and then it's like, oh, they're at Bible study leading a prayer or helping the homeless or, mm -hmm. you know making some great business deal, whatever it is, right? Whatever yeah. type of personality or, or, or coaching your kids. Right. Right. Or looking like a, right. It will drive you crazy. Yeah. And that's the message. Cause I, I do think it's so easy to say, well, why didn't you see it? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously you could see it. And it's like, no one can. I have talked to so many people on this subject. And if you tell a family member that they should have seen it, I do not want to be there. Right. When God, you stand before God and right. have to answer for whatever that, because right. it is so cruel. It is like yeah. going up to a crippled child and saying, how dare you can't walk. Right. It, it is absolute same thing. I agree. And cruel and mean and anybody who you can send them this message, anybody who does it, because it is heartless. It is yeah. heartless. I agree. And you know what I one of the reasons why it's so hard to spot it in the beginning is because of love bombing and narcissists do this in particular. And it's where in the, well, there's two things, love bombing and mirroring. What love bombing is, it's where they will shower you with love and attention. They will be consistent. They'll be text messaging you all day. And then it can get really intense where, you know, Sometimes in a matter of days or weeks, they're like, I love you. I want to get married. You're my soulmate. It, it's a lot of intense attention and adoration and promises up, you know, in the beginning. And some of, some of them do that very quickly. And some of them have a little more subtle form of love bombing. And you just think you've met your soulmate. And the other thing that happens is this mirroring. And this is the part that I think is so deceptive that reels people in. And what mirroring is, is where a narcissist will, they will notice everything about you. They'll notice all your hobbies, your interests. They're going to pay attention to that story about your great grandma, Ruth. They're, you know, they watch your mannerisms, your gestures, and they will literally mirror these things back to you. And it is a technique that they use to make you feel like you've met, you know, Prince or Princess Charming. 
And so here you are thinking, oh my gosh, we have everything in common. I can't believe how much we haven't got. We even like say the same things all the time. And later on, after you've been seduced into this relationship, you realize, oh, he told me he was a yoga guy and he's never even been to a yoga class. Or he doesn't remember anything I'm saying. But in the beginning, he seemed to remember everything. And then the mask starts to come off and you see the real person that you're in a relationship with. And this is why, you know, I agree with you, Sarah, like when people are saying like, how could you fall for this? We don't always see it in the beginning. And I, I wrote this book because as a therapist who's worked with this for many years, I've had several experiences being sucked into a narcissistic relationship and then feeling the shame and embarrassment of like, I am a therapist. I should be able to spot this. How did I not see this? You know, it could happen to anybody. And I really do think it's, have you seen that study where 70 or 80% of people consider themselves above average drivers? No. (laughs) Oh, it's just, you know, it's just silly, but there are, for us to conserve energy for the things that we need, you know, daily living so often we end up, well, that won't happen to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I can eat as much sugar as I want. I won't get diabetes, right? I can smoke. I won't get cancer. I can drive my car really fast. I won't get pulled over, right? So that is kind of how our brains work. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to toxic relationships, it's like, well, I'll never be in a toxic relationship because I'm not as dumb as you. I would have seen it, right? Right. My daughter will see it. My sister will see it. My brother will see it, right? Whatever. And it's just real protective mechanism Mm -hmm. That is about as protective as smoking cigarettes, speeding in the car and, you know, eating ice cream every night, right? right. It's like, no, right. <laughs> it's the worst way to say I would never be dumb enough to fall for a toxic relationship is the biggest sign you are not toxic person proof. Yeah. You will be sucked in and manipulated. I, I can, mm-hmm. you know, I can turn you if I wanted to, knowing the information I have now, right? And and toxic people certainly will be trying to turn you, right? So um, definitely dangerous. Uh, Well, I know you uh, and I are both familiar with a very important study that was done about why people get into toxic relationships. Can you share that with them? Yeah, absolutely. And so I I want to preface this with, you know, there's this idea or there's a lot of, of information that gets shared out there that people that fall for not narcissists or toxic partners are codependent. And that's actually not true. There was a study done um, by Purdue University and Sandra Brown, who I mentioned earlier. And what they, this, I will say the study was only done on women. Um, But what they found was that 63% of the women that had been in these pathological love relationships did not have either histories of childhood trauma, significant histories, or traits of codependency. But what they had were two specific um, personality traits uh, called agreeableness and conscientiousness. And what's important to know about this is that Personality is something that is really pretty much hardwired into us. It develops, you know, we have it pretty much our entire life. And personality traits are not something that we tend to be able to go to therapy and heal. We don't necessarily change a lot of it. But what we can do is learn through awareness of ourselves how to manage them, how to help them, you know, be either a strength or how to how to manage them when they could get us into trouble. And so these two particular personality traits um, are kind of a toxic combination of what could get you in with one of these partners. And so I'll just kind of briefly share how that happens. So with agreeableness, agreeableness is a nice person. It's somebody who's very forgiving. They have a lot of compassion and understanding. They will, they're very tolerant of negative behavior, they'll give people lots and lots of chances. And they, you know, sometimes, and I I think this is sometimes where codependency comes in. I think that a lot of people don't understand personality traits, but codependency is really a mainstream, like a lot of people kind of know that word or toss it around a lot. And so it could look like an agreeable person isn't setting boundaries because sometimes they struggle with boundaries because they're trying to be nice. 
So it their behaviors may look like what we think of as codependency, but it's actually based on the agreeableness. And the agreeableness is what we say gets us into the relationship in the first place, because we'll put up with all this stuff. We'll overlook the red flags because we're being super compassionate about this person. We're like, oh, but you know, they've had so much trauma. They're they're just acting from that, right? Oh, and then her, uh -huh. her, right. So I was talking about this on the podcast. And um, because she was saying that she doesn't think children can be toxic, right? Mm -hmm. Like she didn't believe, and I'm not commenting on whether or not I agree with her or anything, but her the conversation was that um, because I said, you know, some people can be more musical, some people can be more athletic, some people can be born more selfish, right? And she was like, huh, I don't know if I agree with that. And I was like, okay, you know. <laughs> I was like, some kids take turns at three years old and some kids grab the juice box for mm -hmm. themselves. Right. Right. And so, and you're, and I, her work was with children. So she was like, yeah, they just need love and they need nurturing and they need this and I need, they need that. And I said, okay, I didn't say a word about it. But then you could tell she was about to turn on people who'd been in toxic romantic relationships, right? She was, she was doing that shielding herself. And so she said, I mean, why do they do this? Why do they put up with this? Why, why don't they see the behavior? And I said, remember when you said that child who was stealing the juice boxes and pulling hair and kicking just needed more love? At what age do you think that stops? Mm -hmm. at, at what age does it age out? And it's just bad behavior. Right, right. And you, you, she stopped and you could see, I said, that same belief system is what is getting wonderful women in trouble. And right. it's nice. And it's nice. Yeah, it's exactly. So like some kids are little assholes and some are all right. right. Like, I mean, totally, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but it's a complicated conversation. It really is. It really is. And I think there's just a lot of misconceptions about it. And, you know, like the misconception is, well, you were probably raised in a, in a relation, you know, in a childhood home with, trauma or you're, there was domestic violence or, you know, you're just like this doormat who doesn't, who doesn't love yourself and you don't know how to set boundaries. And, you know, the, again, the majority of people in these relationships, that is not their history. Now, there certainly are people that have that history, but the majority do not. And so the other thing is, well, let me, I'll tell you about conscientiousness. And then I want to go back to why it's important to understand the difference between codependency and these traits um, for treatment. So conscientiousness is the second trait. And this is the trait that we say keeps you in the relationship. And somebody who is conscientious has a lot of like high morals and ideals. Like they're very much about, you know, putting kind of a high standard on themselves. They're very, um, you know, they have some of those agreeableness traits as well, where they're, you know, they can be really compassionate. Um, you know, they want to do the right thing and they really hold themselves to a high standard. So if they also have a lot of loyalty, I think that's one important part to remember. So here you have a, you know, your agreeableness part got you into this relationship and then you're in the relationship and you might have the idea that I don't give up. You know, I'm going to go to every therapist in the world to try to keep preserve this relationship. You know, I'm not a quitter or I'm loyal to a fault, right? And so that can keep yeah, you stuck. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm the only person who loves them. I can't give up on them. What if, you know, their potential develops later on, right? I mean, all these, right. like, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so what happens is in this, the codependency, I, I really like, I know a lot of therapists would probably chew my head off for this, but I really think codependency is a myth. I, well, to me, it's an umbrella term and it was helpful for a long time and helping us identify some behaviors. And it really came from the addiction community, but I think there is there is always stuff that underlies the codependent looking behaviors and if we just look at codependency and we don't treat the underlying root of it you, people can be just spinning their wheels so here you know an agreeable person especially agreeable conscientious conscientious could look like somebody with codependency 
There's also attack anxious attachment. This and I won't, that's a whole other <laughs> discussion we could have. But adult attachment can also have a factor in what looks like um codependency. And I believe people with an, a certain attachment style called anxious attachment are more um vulnerable for you know to these pathological love relationships because there's some similar patterning that goes on where they'll put up with a lot of stuff because they're afraid of losing this attachment with this person. Mm -hmm. And so if you have, if let's say you have, you're agreeable and conscientious, you don't have a significant history of trauma other than from the relationship. And you you go to a therapist and they say, you're just being, you're codependent. I'm going to send you, to, you know, you need to go to Al-Anon or Codependence Anonymous and let's work on both bolstering your self-esteem. But you have personality traits that are going to keep you doing these what looks like codependent behaviors. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to heal something that isn't even there to be healed. And this mm -hmm. is why so many people get stuck in one of these relationships after another or stay in the relationship because they're not getting adequate treatment because it's so misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important to discern between I had these traits. I now have trauma because I've been traumatized in the relationship or I have a lot of childhood unresolved trauma. I may even also have those traits as well. So that's your double whammy there, but I need to work on healing that trauma and the trauma of the relationship and learning how to monitor and manage my personality super traits. Does that make sense? And super traits are the conscientiousness and agreeableness. That yes. You're talking about. And there's also, um, openness. Yes. Well, openness right? is part of those traits. It's an aspect of those traits. But there is also one other trait that is a factor in this, not as big as agreeableness and conscientiousness, but it's called harm avoidance. And often people will have low harm avoidance. Well, they'll, they'll have low harm avoidance. It's part of that being open. Like I'm going to be a little bit more of a risk taker. I'm open to new experiences. I'm curious. And then when they get into the relationship and they've experienced the trauma, they start having high harm avoidance. So they become very shut down, they're afraid, they're hypervigilant. And so that part really changes as well. And sometimes that can even keep them in the relationship. They're afraid to take a leap. They're afraid to leave and start over. Afraid, you know, all this stuff starts to just kind of come together to make it even harder to leave. Well, and I want to, I know there's a lot of mothers listening. Okay, so let's say you're raising a daughter and you're teaching her to be nice, open, mm -hmm. and loyal. Yep. It, it's <laughs> such a catch-22 because those are great traits to have. Like people who are agreeable yes. and conscientious and open and kind of, you know, a little safe risk takers, we'll say. That's kind of an oxymoron. Leaders, right? But I'm willing to move. So, right. right. I mean, wonderful qualities. Someone yeah. to try a new hobby, take up a new right. instrument, start to paint, right? It's it's all good qualities. Exactly. And that's where I see con artists are so good. Yes. Con yeah. artists also good. Forgive right. yourself. You've been tricked by a con artist, you yeah. know, what pathological relationships. And oh, this is great. Tell people where they can find out more about you and your book. Okay. Yes. My, um, so my book is on Amazon again, it's insight is 2020, how to trust yourself to protect yourself from narcissistic abuse and toxic relationships. That's a mouthful. Um, and then I have, uh, my website is shellypumphrey.com and you're probably going to want to look at that in writing. Cause I spell my name differently with a CH. Um, and I have, um, I also do coaching and I have um, a toxic relationship recovery online program for women um, and then therapy for people who are in Colorado. So you can find me there. You guys can check that stuff out in the show notes. And Shelly, thank you for helping us become a little more toxic person proof. Thank you so much, Sarah.